Big gains for big tech. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. We are counting you down to the close of markets. Melt up, but we're fading a little bit. I got to say, a little bit of a melt up and then a little bit uh, of a fade. Sure, we're at records for the S&P. Yes, we're at records uh, for the FANG Plus Index. And I say that because it's all a bit tech. Whether you're looking at NVIDIA or Tesla, Microsoft, Google, they're all in this. But for the S&P, we're fading a touch. One of the reasons why comes from the bond market. You're looking at yields really pushing higher. We had a five-year auction that was kind of meh. Demand wasn't that great. There was some concession. Uh, into the bond auction, so you're seeing yields move by uh, four basis points higher. Also, remain we've moved really far, really fast. Even the bull like Ed Yardeni is now a little bit worried about just how far we've come. Yeah, we need to talk about that a little bit later here. We've already blown past all of the estimates for the year. But let's talk about some of the individual stocks here because if there's any doubt here about market leadership, well, you got a big reminder of that today here. Let's take a look at NVIDIA. It was last year's best performing stock, at least among large cap names. And as of today, now it has reasserted itself as the best performing stock here in 2024. Now, the big spark that we see on the day is largely because of that earnings report we got out of ASML over in Europe, an earnings report that seems suggest not only a trough in the chip cycle right now, but actually maybe potentially some good times ahead. And NVIDIA shares up more than 44 percent uh, over the course uh, of, excuse me, 4 percent today over the course of a five-day 12 percent run. That has gifted investors now a more than 26 percent return here just to start the year here. That's more than double the gains that you're going to see from Meta, triple the gains from Microsoft, and almost four times the gains that you got right now on Alphabet. Now, while NVIDIA uh, shines, Tesla is actually the only member of the Magnificent Seven that's down on a year-to-date basis. While the stock is getting the modest bid today, we are expected to get those earning results out of the company a little bit later tonight. We're not quite in panic territory when we talk about that 15% drop to start the year here, particularly when you consider that the stock doubled last year here. But, of course, a lot of concerns right now, not just about how many cars Tesla can sell this year, but more importantly, at what price. There's going to be a lot to talk about with the micro, but we do need to start the show off with the macro here, uh, Alex. There's going to be a big, uh, couple of big economic data points mm -hmm. coming down the bike over the next couple of days. That first look at fourth quarter GDP and, of course, a fresh look here at that monthly PCE inflation data. Yes, growth and inflation, the two core topics, right? So here's my question. Do we see good growth in the fourth in the fourth quarter? So expectations are for two percent. So this bottom line shows a quarter on quarter annualized GDP, right? We're right at four point nine percent. That was the last read for the third quarter. We're supposed to go down to two. OK, but the top part uh, is a month on month read of composite PMI. You got manufacturing, you got services. We got that today at the highest level we've seen since 2022. And it's actually reaccelerating. We're now at 52.3, both in expansion territory for manufacturing and services. Plus, the, everyone felt better. The service and manufacturing industry saw their order books increase. They are a little bit more positive uh, when it comes to the next say, six to 12 months. Can we really see growth decline if those kind of indicators are picking up? I realize one sentiment and I realize one's month on month and this is actual like actual data. But nonetheless, Romain, it raises some questions about just how negative growth will actually be tomorrow. Absolutely here. And we're talking about the potential for a slowdown. We know we're going to get that. The question is, I guess, to what extreme and more importantly, can investors live with it? Ed Hal, who's saying joining us right now, senior currency and rates analyst at Columbia Threadneedle, helping us kick off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon. And Ed, let's start right there here. Uh, there's, we're going to get a nice look here, at least what the, how the economy was performing at the end of last year. And while most people expect that that annual growth rate came down significantly here, it's still, at least for by U.S. standards, still relatively healthy. Yeah, things look pretty good. You know, it's a little bit of a step down from Q3 into Q4. Q3 was really extraordinary, close to 5% growth. Stepping down to 2.5%, uh, I think, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but look at the broader picture. Growth last year was truly solid, particularly when we look at the consumer side of the economy. What's being priced into this market right now? Because when you look at the price action and fixed income, as well as in equities here, it seems on the surface that you have a market that does anticipate maybe a slightly stronger economy. Do you find that? I think that's right. If you look at uh, risk premium, whether it's in equity markets or credit markets, where mm -hmm. credit spreads are significantly uh, compressed at close to historic tights, uh, we're looking at a really good outlook uh, from the perspective of, of risk. At the same time, when you look at rates markets, there's a little bit of weakness in the price. There's clearly an accelerated easing cycle. Uh, that's being priced in. So there's going to be have to there's going to have to be some reconciliation of the two. Uh, I think in the coming there's, quarters. There's four point two percent on a ten year yield. Does that tell me economic times are going to be good going forward? 
Um, I think what it's telling you, particularly if you look at the inflation adjusted rate, you know, close to 2% around, across the curve, um, it's telling you that monetary policy is relatively tight given what's happened to inflation. And I think the key feature of what's happened in the last year is inflation has come down really aggressively. Mm -hmm. And what it's telling me, anyway, is that monetary policy is a little bit on the tight side. It's likely to normalize in the course of the next uh, couple of quarters. So normalizing, not cutting for recession which I feel like is a really big difference when we're looking at how we understand the curve and where you want to place bets. I think that's exactly right. It's sort of a, a two-step dance for the Fed. The first step is responding to the fact that inflation's come down. Yep. And inflation's come down a lot faster than they anticipated. We're close to 2%, uh, depending on how you measure it. The second step will be potentially responding to weakness in the labor market, responding to some uncontrolled um, or unanticipated tightening in financial conditions. That's well into the future. That's hard to anticipate. The first step let's just respond to the fact that inflation's come yeah. down to 2% over the last 18 months. What are the chances, though, that the economy actually does better than we think? Like, I, I realize, like, a PMI versus GDP isn't, like, a, the perfect uh, comparison, but the economy has continued to surprise, and a lot of data is showing that maybe it could be better than we think. I think, especially when we look at the economy through the lens growth, those odds are really good. Consensus expectations are weak. They're around 1%. Uh, for the year, slightly above 1% if you look at uh, the Fed's Q4 or Q4 metric. These are really low numbers. These are below potential growth for the U.S. Odds are will likely surprise them to the upside, particularly in the first half of, of the year. Yeah. When you zoom out a little bit, look at the labor market. The labor market's been weakening pretty much in a linear fashion on the margin. At some point, that starts to show up in the unemployment rate, yeah. and I think that's when things get interesting. Uh, Ed, I, I want to get your thoughts here. Uh, just over the last uh, couple of hours here, we had an interview. David Weston sat down with former Treasury Secretary uh, uh, Robert Rubin. Uh, he raised a lot of concerns about the current U.S. deficit, uh, the servicing costs related to that, and making some correlations, I guess, between some of the policies that have come out of Washington, the moves that we've seen in rates, and ultimately what ends up feeding into the market here. Do you actually see any material risk coming out of the big budget? Uh, what do we call it here? Just lack of interest in dealing with the budget in Washington? Pretty much, yeah. yeah that seems fair. So l let me kind of make two, two broad points. One, if you look at the last 30 years, the debt has grown significantly. We've transitioned into a place where we're running much larger deficits, and yet, in aggregate, the real rate that we're paying on those deficits is lower. Mm -hmm. That's largely reflecting the fact that investors are willing to finance the government. There's a lack of safe haven assets out there. Uh, and the U.S. government has tremendous credibility in terms of being able to lower those deficits going forward. And I think the key question, and this is, I think this is the, the issue that the Secretary brings up, is, uh, is that credibility degrading? If markets sniff out that the government is becoming less credible in its ability to maintain deficits or to consolidate those deficits in the future, rates will rise. And we saw a preview of that uh, in the UK briefly uh, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Uh, is it likely to happen in the US? I don't think so, but these are exceptionally difficult things to, to forecast, I think. All right, and I'm sure you'll be on top of it. Uh, one of the best in the business here, Ed Al Husseini, Senior Currency and Rates Analyst at Columbia Threadneedle, helping us kick off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon with the eye to earnings coming after the bell. Tesla will have a breakdown of what to expect out of those results. Ross Gerber going to be joining us, co-founder and president over at Gerber Kawasaki. Plus, shares of Boeing just whips on on the day. We're going to break down the flood of headlines moving the stock. It's today's stock of the hour. And ghosting is not just for romantic partners anymore. We're going to learn why <laughs> investors are apparently oh, trying to ghost some of their <laughs> finances. See what I did there? A uh, great uh, piece here uh, on the Bloomberg Terminal. We're going to have a full breakdown here of what's going on in that sector when we come back after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Going ghost on investors. So I guess ghost is a verb now for that. All right, startups typically depend on serial infusions of funding from backers to get through their early years. And a so-called down round that's raising money at a lower implied valuation than before is a big black eye. So lately, companies have gotten very creative to try and avoid being considered less 
valuable. Joining us now is Hema Parmar, who wrote the story for Business Week, as well as Ken Smythe, uh, managing partner over at Next Round Capital, who's quoted in the piece and remains giving me a thumbs up because I said both names correctly, which was not a given five seconds ago. Um, <laughs> all right, Hema, when you wrote this piece, what did you find out? Because managing this is really important for startups. Precisely. And in this market where everything has gotten a lot more challenging, people are very concerned about valuations. And companies are concerned about a potential down round or being viewed as less valuable in a tricky market. It can impact their future fundraising, it can impact IPOs. And so some of the things that we're seeing they're doing to avoid potentially being viewed as worth less, ghosting investors, not sharing information with them, impacting the secondary market, blocking secondary transactions, all these kinds of methods to sort of keep their viewpoint and their perspective of investors higher. Ken, that can't be cool. No, it's not. Right, so then where's the visibility? So CEOs are, are really just hoping that, you know, this all goes away one day and that they can cling on as much as they can to 2021 valuations, which as we call is the high watermark. Uh, we're unfortunately a lot lower than that. And so the difference that we're seeing is that 2021 high watermark and people fighting to sort of find balance of what true valuations are. But the challenge, as Hema said, is how do you know the true financial performance of these businesses if they're not giving it to you? And they're only giving selective disclosure. So this is how Sarbanes-Oxley got started in the public markets. Some investors got uh, certain information, others investors didn't. In the private market, it happens every day, right? So you have a wide disparity of valuations and prices of where these companies are trading. And if the CEO on the board doesn't like it, they don't allow it. Okay, so there's, a, there's an issue of the opaqueness of what's going on, not only That's in right. terms of the performance, but also the story points out that there are workarounds to sell off shares in a way that wouldn't be made public or at least not be made uh, privy for the folks who would have a stake or at least uh, have some interest in knowing that that was done. Correct. How do you do that? And, and so you, you basically, it's, it's, you know, it's a workaround, right? It's yeah. called the gray market, right? And this is where you try to keep these transactions away from company management, the board, and you as an LP will say to another LP, hey, I'll create a new LLC structure. You can own the LLC structure and buy it. And, you know, it's just our deal, how right? Much, how much of this, though, is being spurred from internally by those companies? And how much of it is from the outside pressure of by investors and LPs? I mean, there are a lot of folks who have raised a lot of questions in this recent cycle about the returns that were promised and the returns that they have not yet gotten. That's right. So we're, we're in an environment right now where this business, venture capital, was $27 billion dollars of invested capital in 2012. Currently, as of last year, we're at $345 billion. So a massive growth. The number of unicorns went from nine in 2012 to 345 today. So you can understand this is now what used to be 10, 12 years ago, really kind of a small little cottage industry has now grown into a massive amount of companies that are now having to abide by standards that were set many, many years ago, yeah. right? And so. Basically, the growth of the market hasn't kept pace. Um, and so LPs are upset, right? They want what they call DPI, which is basically a return of their cash. Yeah. They were told eight, nine, ten years ago, by 2024, like, mm -hmm. you know, when the Jetsons were flying around, when the Jetsons are going to be flying around, you're going to have your money back with a 2 to 3x return. Yeah. Well, many of those fund one and fund two still haven't given a dollar back. Yeah. And so with an IPO market that's been slow, M&A market that's been very tepid, you only have one option, is you can sell in the secondary market or you continue to wait till venture capital markets tell you what they're worth. Am I, if the Fed cuts rates, does this all go away? I mean, it's going to take time because companies are uh, dealing with cash flow issues. They're dealing with debt they have to pay off. Um, it's going to be a little while. And some of them still haven't been marked down by investors nearly as much as they may need to be. So there is this lag between public markets and private markets. And you see that in sometimes 18 months delay. So things will probably get better as rates come down. But it's going to take some time, I think. And in addition to that, only have about 30 seconds left. Does a healthier IPO market, does that absolve some of this? It does. It doesn't, it doesn't. It actually, this is where CEOs are really trying to guide the valuation because yeah. as you start talking to bankers, yeah. they start paying attention to where actual transactions are happening, right? So the least or the lesser data they have pointing to a lower valuation, yeah. they can turn around and tell their bankers, hey, we've got stock that's trading at a premium or close to our valuation. That's where we, our IPO should go out. But the, the, right. the public markets yeah. 
are always going to determine what these companies are worth. So they're going to have their day in the sun at some point. Yeah. It just doesn't happen in the private markets. All right. Well said, Ken. Going to have to leave it there. Really fascinating story here. Ken Smythe, Next Round Capital Partners founder, and our very own Emma Palmer, who has uh, what is, quite frankly, the story of the day uh, for me. You can check it out in Bloomberg Business Week and, of course, right there on your Bloomberg terminal. Coming up here on the program, a check on supply chains, a check on transportation as we await for earnings over the next few days and weeks from CSX, Knight Swift, and several other companies. A discussion here about what to expect on the close. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with AMD and the potential of AI. New Street Research lifting its recommendation to buy from neutral and setting a $215 price target. The analyst there, Pierre Ferragu, expecting, uh, expecting spending on AI chips to actually boom to about $400 billion by 2027. And in his view, he says any company out there that would be best positioned to take advantage of that, it's going to be AMD. Those shares up 5%. 177. That's a record high on the stock. Next up here, well, let's take a look at Biogen. Getting a downgrade today over at UBS to neutral. A lot of concern here about that company's Alzheimer's drug and some of the slow uptick that we're seeing right now in terms of demand. The analysts not actually seeing any real catalyst out there that would change that trajectory. That's why you got the downgrade there. That's why you see the stock lower by about a percent on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Uber. Losing its buy rating over at Gordon Haskett. The Gordon Haskett going down to neutral today here. The analyst says that Uber deserves the premium relative to its competitors here, but says that right now, anything that could potentially move the stock higher has already been priced in. Those shares down about a percent on the day, 63.57, and those are some of our top calls. All right, let's turn now to what is going to be uh, a big earnings story of the day. Transport companies, CSX and Knight Swift, are scheduled to release results after the bell tonight. Let's get a preview on the health of those companies and really the broader transportation and supply chain sector. John Chappelle, research analyst over at Evercore ISI, joining us right now. He has an uh, outperform rating on CSX. So let's start there here uh, with the rail freight company here. What are your general expectations here? This is a company that for a while seemed like it was kind of on a path to a resurgence. Yeah, thanks, Romain. So for CSX, I'm not expecting anything uh, too robust. I mean, just an inline result here I think will be good enough. I think the most important thing we're looking for is 2024 volume expectations, and I think there'll be a pretty broad range there, something um, somewhat opaque like better than GDP or better than industrial production. But probably the biggest takeaway we'll see uh, from CSX is how they talk about productivity and incremental margins as it relates then to that volume growth. You know, CSX is typically the first railroad to report almost every quarter. But given a funky calendar this uh, this quarter, Canadian National reported last night, had a very robust and potentially even ambitious volume outlook for 2024, but very muted margin and EPS growth in relation to that volume growth. So I think that the U.S. rails, CSX tonight, Union Pacific tomorrow, Norfolk Southern Friday morning, mm -hmm. will have better things to say about incremental margins and then growing earnings uh, with a better volume expectation. How much does that tie, though, into economic conditions? Because there are a lot of people, they look at uh, consumer spending, they look at manufacturing activity, and they try to sort of extrapolate sort of uh, the flow of goods around the country and how uh, that either helps or maybe potentially hurts CSX and its peers. Yeah, exactly. And I think what, what's really interesting about the rails for 2024 is this is the one segment of transportation that was a net loser during the goods boom post the lockdowns in the early stages of the pandemic. They didn't have the service reliability to move the cargo when it was more timely than it was a margin store to the retailer. So they lost a lot of share. And now when their service is better, they put a lot of costs into the system. This is why we're talking about in incremental margins for 24, because it was decremental margins in 23 in the back half of 22. So they have a lot of share to gain, even in a stable ice cube. The, the, the ice cube may be melting a little bit, but as rails take a lot more share off the highway, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of growth potential for their intermodal segment, uh, really for the overall volume story in rails, while the others, trucking companies, maybe a good segment to the tonight, um, stagnate a little bit. Stable ice cube. I don't know I've ever heard that before, John. Um, but to you that point, <laughs> does that also mean that if there is a downturn, CSX, will be very, very hard pressed to lay off people and trim their workforce, like there's no fat to then trim? Yeah, that's exactly right, Alex. I mean, for what's happened in the last 20 years is the rails have been able to flex variable costs very quickly uh, in downturns and freight. And given the regulatory landscape, some of the service issues they had the last two years, um, you know, the, the unions have become uh, quite more emboldened. They just don't have those levers to pull. So that was a big 
you know, issue for the rails in 23. Right. Volumes were weak in 23, and they weren't able to take uh, incremental costs out. In fact, they had to add them. That's the opportunity for 24, 25. Now, if we go into a hard landing and recessionary backdrop, then certainly I think it's going to be difficult for any rail to improve their margins. So what's in the stock? We're, we're like a stone's throw away from a 52-week high. The stock's had a really nice run. I know you said that sort of in line will be good enough, but what's going to be kind mm -hmm. of the next catalyst to get even more juice going? Well, there's going to be two things. I mean, tonight, again, it's going to have to be a focus on margin improvement. Can they get incremental margins in a decent volume environment? But over the coming weeks, it's going to be a story about volume growth again. Are you going to get that market share back? Are you going to grow better than GDP? Are you going to win the share that you lost over that two-year period? And it kind of filters into a domino effect. If rails get the volume, they should be able to get the incremental margins and greater EPS growth. Typically, also when rails get volume, they get multiple expansion. CSX is one of the few companies in all of transports who are trading at more of a kind of a trough multiple than they are a peak multiple. Everyone's trying to buy the last cut. Where's the next positive rate of change? Huge multiples on trucking companies, on even the Canadian rails. Um, but the U.S., especially the eastern rails, are trading at muted, muted multiples. And I think they'll get some of that expansion as the volume comes back as well. All right. Uh, all right. Thanks. Uh, and so, John, it gets to this idea, too, uh, when we talk about uh, sort of the, the feed through here to economic conditions and more importantly, uh, how investors view this. Is there really a case to be made for, I guess, the value uh, that we used to sort of find out of the, a lot of these companies? The idea that uh, they were kind of seen as value plays. Some of them, at least in the old days, used to actually pay pretty healthy dividends. Mm -hmm. Though I know that ship might have actually sailed. Uh, but is there a sort of a case to be made for that actually coming back? It depends on the stock. I mean, we're pretty cautious on most of our coverage universe. We like CSX, we like Norfolk Southern, we like Union Pacific, effectively the U.S. rails. But we're neutral to, you know, even more cautious on most of our other coverage. You know, we didn't talk really about night much as the, you know, the, the biggest indicator, the bellwether for the trucking industry. But this is an industry now that's in the 23rd month of what we'd consider a freight recession. So the restocking thesis that a lot of people are kind of anticipating or had been anticipating for 12 months, that retailers are going to start buying aggressively again and restocking their inventories, it hasn't played out. And we're far more cautious on the outlook for that occurring, at least in the next six months and potentially even the next 12. Hmm. All right, John, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. John Chappelle over at Evercore ISI. That reminds me kind of what DuPont was saying. And I realize DuPont's more levered to China, but the idea that the businesses that they serve are destocking. They're not refilling their stocking. And, that, and, that, and that's causing problems for them. It's yeah, similar. and how many people have we spoken to right here on this program that have talked about what he just talked about in the retail space here, yeah. uh, people getting that inventory under control. And I guess if you're a company that ships inventory, that's not exactly what you want to hear. No, not at all. All right, staying with the companies, Tesla, it's the day. Uh, the growth in the spotlight, margins in the spotlight, profitability in the spotlight. We're going to get a take on what to watch as they report after the closing bell today. This is Bloomberg. the New York City streets, 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. Our right, Tesla, we're like, what, half an hour away, 40 minutes away yeah. from Tesla? That's going to be big. Investors very much uh, waiting for this after the bell. It's profit margins. It's going to be delivery. It's going to be all that stuff. Yeah, I always don't know what to make of these results because obviously we know a lot about their production and deliveries because they put out the monthly True. updates. And then, of course, Elon is always out there uh, chatting it up here. I, I guess the big question really is here is what's the growth story going to be? It's obviously not going to be the Cybertruck. I'm talking about for the company as a whole. I know there's going to be a refresh potentially uh, of uh, some of their models this year. Uh, so is this going to be a story where they can sell more units? Or is this going to be a much more of a story about pricing and, more importantly, some of those discounts that were all the talk over the last few months? And this always brings back, like, the whole, is Tesla a car company or is it a tech company? Because it's the worst performer in the Mag 7. Oh. So does that wind up sort of dragging on, yeah. on growth well, this I year? Well, I went through its 10K. I, I, I'm pretty certain it's a car company. They, they, make, it... they make cars. Right. I yeah. agree with you, okay. but really? And just cars. <laughs> but they're valued like a tech company. <laughs> I know. Like they're Mag 7, so you have to wonder, like, if they disappoint or it's not great, do they wind up dragging down the whole tech sector? Does that disrupt the market? Or is Tesla just going to be its own kind of story? Yeah, well, I think, I think for the, the sake of the rest of the market, maybe some people hope so. Maybe. Yeah. All right, well, Ross Gerber is co-founder, president, and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki. He probably doesn't hope so. <laughs> he owns about 388,000 uh, shares of Tesla. If we get a dip after earnings, Ross, are you buying it? 
Um, not not at these prices, but if we really get a nice dip in the stock over the next couple months, we might. But you know, when you look at their earnings expectation and their price earnings ratio, you know, it's it's a stretch to see how this stock gets you know much higher. Mm -hmm. um, but it could actually go much lower, and that could be an opportunity for investors. So so we're going to see how it goes. But you know, when you got Nvidia trading at let's say thirty times forward earnings and Tesla trading at sixty times forward earnings, it's it's kind of hard to compare. So in early 2022, you had margins, profit margins like 30%, and we're like half of that now. Ross, how much do you care about that number? I care tremendously about that number because, you know, with all economics, if you have unit sales and lower and lower margins, you know, essentially you're offsetting your growth with lower and lower profit margins, so you actually earn no more money. And that's what Teslas seem to have gotten themselves into this pickle. Now, the irony of it is it's because they don't advertise. So here's a company that spends zero on advertising, where some companies spend five to as high as 20% of their or higher of their revenue on advertising. And so Tesla's got $26 billion in cash, just earning interest, and, and they've got waning interest in the vehicles while they increase supply, but they're doing nothing to increase demand, and, and that's putting pressure on margins. I am curious as to what they can do. I mean, obviously, advertising could be a component of that, but as I'm sure you know, Ross, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we've kind of already gotten past, I guess, that first peak in the EV boom, the idea that all the early adopters basically have their cars, and now you're trying to sort of woo a lot of people who are still on the fence about Correct. EVs overall, not necessarily Tesla specifically, but just about EVs overall, charging, range anxiety, all that stuff that goes into it. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the point. So like 90% of people still don't really understand all the value propositions of owning an EV. And then recently during the storms, you know, in the really freezing weather, it was somehow national news that it was hard to fill up your EV <laughs> like it was any easier to fill up a gas car. I don't think so, because... Freezing minus 22 doesn't work in gas stations either. But, you know, the news covers Tesla and then Tesla does nothing to offset this. Um, and so any story is true, essentially, because they don't even comment when the media, you know, contacts them about these stories. So so they'll tweet. But yeah. unfortunately, Elon doesn't understand that most people, 99 percent of people don't actually look at X or Twitter. And so <laughs> tweeting does nothing to help. Yeah. Tesla. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation, Ross. I, I am curious, though, about sort of what you've envisioned or maybe let me rephrase that. What do you want the next growth story to be for this company? Because, I mean, they've sort of reached critical mass. I mean, they control 55 percent of this market, at least here in the U.S. Uh, and I know that's come down a little bit given the new entrance here. But they are the dominant player here. And of course, their charging network, at least right now, is second to none here. So what right. can they do, I guess, going going forward longer term in terms of introduction of new vehicles or maybe even a pivot in some way that would really sort of be a catalyst for a huge revaluation of this stock? You know, truthfully, they have the product roadmap already. That is what I want them to do. The business plan that we bought into is Cybertruck and semi-trucks is really the next big stage for Tesla. So they've released and launched the Cybertruck, and it's a polarizing vehicle for sure. But you know, it yeah. has the potential to sell at least a hundred to two hundred thousand or more. You a think year. so, really? And they, the, oh, the, for sure. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, they sell millions of pickup trucks a year in the United States, but the price point is so high that a typical truck buyer won't buy a Cybertruck until it's priced much lower. And that, I think, is a huge opportunity because most people in construction and using trucks actually drive a ton. And, and like the construction workers who work at my house, for example, spend upwards of 15 percent of their income just on gasoline. So imagine, yeah. you know, if you're in construction, the value of having an electric vehicle, but they are not buying eighty thousand dollar trucks. Yeah. So the, Tesla needs to address the truck market It's a huge opportunity. And these are great you know, buyers and and they want electric vehicles. So um, we'd love to see the semi and yeah. cyber ramp and and you know that's just yeah. the beginning they have lots of other great stuff too like getting full self-driving to actually work but why would they choose a cyber truck and i know the cyber truck may be sort of a precursor to something maybe that's a little bit more practical for folks but when you have an f-150 lightning for example you have the rivian right. pickup you have a lot of other pickups that at least in terms of the traditional styling that they offer relative to the cyber truck i think would have a little bit more appeal for those folks who are actually going to use a pickup truck for what it's intended 100%. purpose was yeah 
Right, but the Cybertruck also attracts people that would would not otherwise buy a truck like myself. Okay. So, you know, like I would never drive a pickup truck just for the sake of it, yeah. but I would drive You're a, missing a cyber out, truck. Ross. And, Come on. <laughs> pickup you trucks know, are cool depending on I, the, the I do you like park one of those trucks, huh? actually, on the Upper West Side. I, I do. So. I live in Manhattan, so I guess it's impractical. There's reasons to have a, a pickup truck for sure, but you know, I'm actually really into fast cars, you know, like really fast cars. So I <laughs> I drive a plat fastest car on earth. What's that? The the Model S Plaid, you know, so I drive okay. the fastest car on earth and I burn these Bugattis and Maseratis and everything else that try to race me every day. It's fun. Well, not every day. But. Uh, definitely not. Oh, so in that New York was City. Ross I saw on the street when I saw the Model S racing one of the Bugattis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ross, my question is like, well, like longer term, like we all know the EVs are going to take it, right? But in the meantime, it does feel like hybrid might actually be a good solution and that a lot of the car makers missed a big trick with that and that that leaves a big window for like Toyota. What do you think about the the hybrid in the middle? So I think the high, you know, I don't want to say bad things about hybrid because they're still energy efficient vehicles and, and, and serve a great purpose in the marketplace in getting people to transition to electric vehicles. But most importantly, it's better for the environment. But the idea of a hybrid vehicle is really stupid you know, when you really just drive an all electric vehicle that works perfectly fine, why would you need a hybrid? And the main reason hybrids have been successful is because of pricing. And, you know, you can buy a hybrid for a very reasonable price and, and save money on gas. And, and I think it's a great alternative if you're driving a gas car. So I think hybrids have a place in the marketplace that isn't going to go away. But when you drive an all electric vehicle, the performance of an all electric vehicle over a hybrid is like day and night. And then the efficiency of a Tesla, for example, where there's, you know, you were arguing that it's a car company. And I would say, you know, the reason why you're wrong about that is because when you drive a Tesla and you use the software, it compares to no other vehicle. The, the It's an iPhone it is pretty that cool. drives. It's yeah. an iPhone. So I would argue Tesla's a battery maker before yeah. I would argue it's a car maker. Okay. You know, so they that, make lots of batteries that can be used for lots of things. But now I look <laughs> at their charging business and I'm yeah. like, this is a gold mine. This is a huge opportunity, huge, right. massive. So, you know, Tesla has a yeah. lot of potential growth in the future. And if right. Elon focuses yeah. and really tries to create demand, they'll be great. All right, Ross, I love you. We love always <laughs> your insights. One day we have to have like a Lincoln Douglas style debate here about whether it's a For car sure. company or a tech For company sure. here, because I've got some opinions. Uh, Ross, always well, great. I'll take, I'll take you to the company and you'll <laughs> see when you walk in the door, it's all tech people working on software. All right, it's a date. Ross, and great. then robots. All right, I've got to leave it there. Ross, great to catch up with you. <laughs> Ross Gerber, co-founder, president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki. Stick with us. A lot more coming up here on Bloomberg. We fly safe planes. We don't Easy put airplanes in the air that we don't have 100% confidence in. I'm here today in the spirit of transparency to, number one, recognize the seriousness of what you just asked. Number two, to share everything I can with our Capitol Hill interests um, and answer all their questions because they have a lot of them. Dave Calhoun there, the CEO of Boeing. This after a meeting with lawmakers down in Washington, D.C. Shares of Boeing actually higher on the day, up about 1.6 percent here. A lot of concern right now about how the plane maker is addressing some of those safety and regulatory issues surrounding its MAX 9 fleet. We're taking a closer look at the stock right now. It is our stock of the hour. Abigail Doolittle standing by here to walk us through this here. I was actually taking a look to see. I see they've kind of clawed back a lot of the losses uh, that the stock had coming out of that when we first learned about that Alaska Airlines incident. And not quite there yet here, but investors seem to think that this is something that they can manage and something that's not going to have a long-term material impact on the company. Well, in some ways, today's uh, meeting in Congress or in Capitol Hill really has, it speaks to the idea that this is a crisis of confidence. So they're clearly addressing that piece of it. There's the mechanical side of it. As a consumer, an airline consumer, the idea that you're hearing the CEO of a major airline manufacturer saying, we fly safe planes, that's just something that you take for granted. But after the two tragedies in 2018, 2019, yeah. uh, the rudder issue last year, the door plug blowing out last Saturday, a wheel fell off. I mean, they really have a situation. It's pretty clear that there's some mechanical issues with them putting together their planes. There was a Seattle Times article out today saying that it wasn't Spirit Aerosystems' fault in terms of the door plug blowing out. It was an issue with Boeing putting it in properly. Yeah. So they have to address this.
Now, from the investor standpoint, the crisis of confidence, he does seem to be doing a decent job. Dave Calhoun came in as CEO in 2020 uh, to take over after those tragedies in 2018 and 2019. Now, though, given the fact that there are so many smaller issues, but ones that really are a little bit scary to anybody who's going to go onto one of those planes, you have to wonder, uh, it, it, could there be changes made there? So he's fighting for himself as well. Yeah. The numbers, they've gone down from 2018 to now by about 25 percent for sales. Uh, they haven't been profitable in a number of years. They will be reporting next week. I think that there's going to be a, clearly a ton of uh, uh, inquiry into the 737 MAX. What are they going to do? I think that the one thing, if they're able to be turned profitable before expected at some point, that could clearly be a big thing. But the stock's still down 50 percent from that 2019 peak. Yeah. So they've got their work cut out for them. All right, Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate Bloomberg's Abigail Doodle. Interesting remain that today of all days, Boeing 737 MAX has been delivered to China for the first time since 2019. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Uh, timing that just overlap, but the timing. There. Yeah, the thing is interesting too, and I almost kind of forgot that that Calhoun was actually brought in after the Lion mm -hmm. Air and the, and the other uh, uh, major crash here, and it was it raises a lot of question as to whether that was the right decision. I mean, we know he was a capable executive, but this is a company that is dealing with a lot of other issues. And she said this is more about the confidence rather right. than just operations itself. Yep, culture problem. Like a culture makes a difference. It's hard yeah. to transform that. Um, all right, well, coming up next, our next guest says that we are in a sweet spot for markets. Dare I say Goldilocks? She Shaw Goldman Sachs is seeing some opportunity next. We are about 15 minutes away from the close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. And Alex, I know you hate this rally, but guess what? Five straight days now. S&P up again, only up a tenth of a percent. But you know how this works. It was a record high yesterday. So a tenth of a percent means a record high today. A record high today. The tech <laughs> melt up. And I just wanted to point out like what's happening with tech. Because if you look at the ADR of ASML, uh, a record high over in Europe after killer earnings. And really continuing that here as well. Microsoft at one point hit a $3 trillion valuation. 52-week high. Uh, Google, same thing, at a record high. On the downside, and I pointed this out, Romain, earlier, and this feels important as the underlying economy is DuPont. It's a chemical maker. Their outlook for demand was not great. I appreciate that might be just a China story, but the chemical guys are not coming out with strong numbers. Just look at, say, 3M, short cycle industrial. Uh, look at BASF uh, over in Europe. Chemical sector weak, and what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely, and it raises a lot of questions, too, about all that uh, breadth that we were talking about yesterday, Alex, if everyone's just gravitating Yes. Back to big tech. Ashish Shaw joining us right now, CIO for public investing at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. As we count you down to the closing bell, just about nine minutes away. And you saw the, you know, kind of what Alex was alluding to here. I mean, there's certainly uh, an area of this market that people are gravitating back to. And I don't know if that becomes a concern because the whole idea late last year was that we were finally starting to see to broaden out in what people were buying, what people were willing to buy. And now, it just seems like people are retrenching back to, I guess, what is tried and true, and that's big tech. Well, let, let's go back to why they're going back there. I mean, you consider the fact that the last two years, companies have really pulled back on their tech spending. You know, we've seen 3% tech spending growth. This is the year where CIOs at companies are confident enough to be investing in tech. And so you're getting a fundamental tailwind that is driving this valuation. We all know how high the margins are for this business. And I'm not even going to get into AI, which kind of opens up the value that a CIO can offer inside their company. So I think the real strong underpinnings. Can it get ahead of itself? Of course it can. But I think it's a good long-term play here um, to invest in these companies. I, I certainly understand the optimism, particularly longer term, and particularly when you factor in things like AI here. I'm wondering, is there an economic fundamental story there as well? Because if there is, wouldn't that also push up the Russell 2000 instead of like it is for the last two days yeah. down in the red? So I, I, I think one of the biggest surprises that we saw in the markets last year is when we got this Fed pivot, people weren't prepared for it, right? And, and so they had been hiding in kind of certain parts of the markets why you saw this breadth uh, in the market expand, right, as you got the pivot of, wait, maybe we don't go into recession next year. Um, and I think part of the reason why you have seen good performance, not fantastic, but good performance um, within small caps is just the sheer cheapness mm -hmm. relative to these large caps. So as you make your money in the large cap part of the market, it gives you the opportunity to then diversify your holdings 
you know, down in small caps. And I think it's simply a matter of time. Which then leads to the Fed cuts and kind of why they're doing it, because that's going to kind of lead to what's the setup for small caps. Uh, we spoke to Ed Al Husseini, senior currency and rates analyst at Columbia Threadneedle at the top of the hour. He's been here to say about rate cuts. It's sort of a, a two-step dance for the Fed. The first step is responding to the fact that inflation's come down. The second step will be potentially responding to weakness in the labor market, responding to some uncontrolled um, or unanticipated tightening in financial conditions. So a normalization versus then everything sucks and we got to cut. So from that perspective, like what's the play for small caps? Well, look, I, I think the the you know simple thing that you need to. Uh, consider here, and as someone that maybe isn't the best dancer, that <laughs> you, you have to think about the fact that the inverted yield curve has kept people on the sidelines, right? So when that happens, you're going to open up um, the, the opportunity set for small caps, but it really comes down to you know the timing, and you're not going to time it perfectly, right? A anyone that went through October and November of last year waiting for the perfect time to go in you know, most of those people missed it. Mm -hmm. And so I think being a little bit ahead, really looking at the valuation and making sure you're picking the companies How that are going to benefit. value trap, though? Well, you don't have to go after pure value. You can go after quality um, that represents good value relative to large caps, right? What, large what, caps. What does that mean, though? Like, what, what does that mean, quality in so, context? So in my mind, quality is you're generating free cash flow. You're anchored towards co customers that actually have long-term growth. Right, so you're tilted with a new tech stack as opposed to try having to run a melting ice cube business. Like these are all great opportunities. The biggest biggest thing that I always keep in mind is like, okay, what is going to work over the next three to five years? And if you work backwards from that and say, okay, it can be cheap, it can be rich, but you want to make sure that whatever you're buying um, aligns to that long-term trend. Um, what don't you like? What would be considered risky right now? Look, I, I, I think that companies that are generating negative free cash flow here um, and have more debt are really challenged, right? You are going to see rates come lower, but that isn't going to help a company that either is, doesn't have the capital to invest, doesn't have the timeline, right, or, or um, is going to face the issue of competition uh, where they don't have pricing power. And, and pricing power is something that as inflation is coming down, we're getting to learn who, uh, who uh, has pricing power within this market. In some cases, it's you know, companies that have real product differentiation. In others, it's ones that have great relationships with, with their customers, really have kind of alignment yeah. to how those customers are doing well. Uh, I want to just make a quick pivot here. Uh, we actually had an interview a little bit earlier with uh, Robert Rubin, uh, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary. I want you to listen to what he had to say about uh, U.S. deficits and, and the markets. I think that the risks are even greater today because our debt-GDP ratio is a approximately, well, CBO estimates at about 100 percent right now. It's the highest in the history of the country except for 1946 and 47 when we were coming back out of World War II. I think the risks are enormous, and some of them are materializing already, like higher interest rates and effect on inflation, you know, in part, not in full. And others haven't materialized yet, but I think they're out there and, and sooner or later will materialize if we don't correct our, our fiscal trajectory. Uh, a smart man and a smart take there, but a smart take that I think, I don't know, I felt like I heard a decade ago and maybe two decades mm -hmm. ago, maybe three decades ago. When does this start to matter for the markets? Look, it matters when growth and uh, deflation come back. Mm -hmm. Right, because if you have a modest level of inflation, you can sustain kind of debt growth. Mm -hmm. But um, when growth slows down, right, when your demographics go negative and your population starts shrinking, you can't support that that debt anymore. And so it's the same thing in, in, when you're an individual. Yeah. If you borrow to buy a house that goes up in value, having a lot of debt isn't about a big problem. If you borrow to consume, that means the future is going to be less good than today. And I think that that's the thing we have to make sure of. Mm -hmm. You know, look, what I, I know of is that the U.S. has some of the best assets out there yeah. and most innovative companies. And frankly, that's what we're excited about. All right, she's going to have to leave it there. Great to catch up with you. She's Shaw, CIO over for public investing over at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Stick with us. We're about to take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. 
Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with five of your most favorite people. That includes Scarlet Fu, that includes Carol Masser, and it even includes Tim Five Stenevig. of your most favorite? Yeah. Maybe that these should just be your favorite people. All right, well, a hearty welcome to all of our audiences across <laughs> all of our Bloomberg platforms. Television, radio, originals, our partnership with YouTube, the S&P, up fractionally, but it's the fifth straight day of gains, and if this holds, it's a record high. Yeah, unbelievable. I feel like the superlatives that we kicked off with a couple of hours ago, it's just, you see stocks, what was it, um, Alphabet, we saw... Meta platforms. Meta platforms, all at all-time highs, just taking out um, some Microsoft. of these significant levels. Did that make you feel good or you get worried? <laughs> I get well, a little worried. You bring up a good question, Romain. I think there are certain people who are starting to get worried. We were just talking about Ed Yardeni, who mm -hmm. came out yeah. with a note that uh, said that he's concerned the S&P 500 may be starting a tech-led melt-up, similar to what happened in the second half of the 90s. I think people would push back on that, saying, okay, well, these are different types of companies now. But he did use the term irrational exuberance. Well, no irrational exuberance when it comes to Tesla, which, of course, will be reporting earnings soon. It's the magnificent seven stock that hasn't done much of anything in 2024 so far. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my thing, though, when it comes to sort of how we got over our skis, the average uh, price forecast for the S&P, we're, like, really close to that. It's, like, for just over 4900 So what happens, Romain, if we hit that, Romain, and all of a sudden, what, all the strategists come in and, like, redo their forecast already and it's the first few weeks in jam? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, look, I mean, right now, I mean, it'll be interesting to see as we get more of these earnings reports, we get more of this commentary, whether that ends up front running uh, some of the economic data. And we do have a lot of earnings on tap uh, after the bell. That includes Tesla, LAM Research, IBM ServiceNow, and CSX, just to name a few. Let's walk through the numbers before those earnings hit with a Dow Jones Industrial Average that had spent a good portion of the day in the green, uh, flipping into the red, down two tenths, three tenths of a percent here on the day, lower by about 99 points. The S&P 500 higher by four points. That may not be much, but that is, yes, indeed, a fresh record high. I should point out RSI is t now firmly in overbought territory on the S&P, as it is on the NASDAQ as well. The NASDAQ closing higher by about four-tenths of a percent here on the day, and the Russell 2000 sitting, one, sitting this one out lower on the day by seven-tenths of a percent. All right, as we await uh, a batch of earnings, guys, S&P 500, you had 141 names to the upside, 357, though, losing ground uh, amid all this irrational exuberance, or whatever you want to call it, Scarlet five unchanged. All right, let's take a look at how the sectors are performing. Let's bring up the IMAP, which shows the different sectors in the form of a pie, and it's a pretty mixed bag here. One thing to note is that you are seeing some strength in energy stocks as oil prices, WTI, climbs above $75 a barrel, and Alex had noted earlier the weakness in chemical companies. Material stocks are uh, certainly weaker at the moment, and we do have some earnings now, yep. Alex. Yep, CSX. Uh, I love me some trains. Uh, fourth quarter <laughs> revenue coming in at $3.68 billion that's a little higher than estimates. Earnings coming in uh, at 45 cents a share, a little higher than estimates. The operating income a little light than estimates, but so far so good, sort of relatively solid, Car uh, solid Carol. The, the real issue is going to be about higher wages and benefits and those profit margins. Right, exactly. And they've been certainly watching their costs in a big way. I'm looking at a stock that's little change on the year. We look at something like trains, right, in terms of moving stuff around. We were talking a little bit earlier about the problems in the Red Sea and the logistical problems. So, you know, you keep a name, uh, watch on one of these names, but it's unchanged in the after hours, so it looks like Investor Scarlet trying to make some sense of it. Trying to make some sense of it, and of course, looking ahead to the other results, what would you say the overall picture is from the companies that have reported, Romain? Well, it's been positive. I mean, the expectations were lower than, I guess, what expected, but so far, at least on an aggregate basis, I mean, they've continued to beat all of those, uh, not only on the earnings, but also even on the revenue side as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're still early days, though. I mean, we still have a lot of companies to hear from. We have to hear from Tesla today. Netflix, of course, was huge uh, blowout. Net, uh, we got Apple next Thursday. So, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're getting through it, but there's still a few companies to hear from. The other thing I would say, the Sox was an outperformer, ASML coming in, and they had orders tripling. Um, this is, you know, a company that produces equipment to make some of the most sophisticated chips out there. When I see kind of a bullish signal like that, it makes me think about demand, Alex, from all of uh, its users and customers. Yeah, but I just want to point out again, DuPont. I mean, we're, we're looking at the worst day, I think, since like 2008 for this stock. Chemical company, real economy, and the outlook for demand is not great, Scar. Yeah, not great, and it certainly raises a lot of concerns about other companies in a similar industry. And it goes back to that idea about industrial customers showing some weakness. Uh, that's something we heard from Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. Carol, as much as the ASML came out with good numbers and TSMC certainly revived optimism for the semiconductor industry, Texas Instruments was a bit of a cold water reality check. Yeah.
Yeah, no, it's interesting, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a reminder. But we have to remember, like, right, all of these chip companies are the same. And I think about something that's actually equipment, which is kind of the early end of uh, that semi-cycle, if you will. And so, I don't know. We'll ultimately see, right, when we get through all of these earnings. And we have Tesla. It has just crossed. <laughs> yeah, so let's get right to it here with Tesla. The numbers coming in, EPS, the bottom line number, coming in at $2.27 a share. I have to look up uh, the comparison there, but on an adjusted basis, here's your comparison. 71 cents a share on an adjusted EPS basis. That's a bit of a miss. By about two cents, the street was looking for 73 cents a share. Here's your revenue number, $25.17 billion. That's also a slight miss. The street, on average, was looking for $25.87 billion in revenue. The free cash flow number, that looks like a beat coming in at about 2.1 billion. The street was looking for about one and a half billion. And here's your gross margin number, a number that Ross Kerber said he was paying close attention to a miss 17.6 percent on fourth quarter gross margin. The street was looking, guys, for 18.1 percent. OK, well, let's talk about some of these reasons why profitability uh, uh, operating income decreased year over year to 2.1 billion dollars in the fourth quarter. Reduced vehicle average sales price due to pricing and mix increase in operating expenses, partly driven by AI and other R&D projects. Lower full self-driving revenue recognition year over to year. The cost of the Cybertruck production ramp. Lower cost per vehicle. Growth in vehicle deliveries. And gross profit, growth in energy uh, generation and storage. So there's a host of reasons why profit got hit. Yeah, and uh, 2020, this is a kicker. 2024 vehicle volume growth may be notably lower than 2023 notably lower i mean i mean that can't be good you're seeing the stock kind of roll over now in after hours um we also of course want to just mention cybertruck because elon musk likes to talk about so much not a whole lot of details at least in this early release uh, but cybertruck production and deliveries will be ramping up throughout the year um and of course there aren't we, we know that they are not being able to deliver on as many Cybertrucks as they wanted, and this has been a long, long delayed vehicle as well. But it's something that uh, Elon Musk has talked up big time. Hey, listen, and they're also talking about liquidity. We have sufficient liquidity to fund our pro product roadmap, long-term capacity, expansion plans, and other expenses. Furthermore, we will manage the business such that we maintain a strong balance sheet during the uncertain period. So kind of addressing some of maybe those concerns about cash on hand. Uh uh, okay. I, don't, I mean, can you read in between the lines and tell me what that means in like real speak here? Because I'm not seeing that in the numbers at all. I'm also curious as to what the actual growth story is. Mm -hmm. Is it a ramp up of Cybertruck, uh, basically what is right now a hundred thousand dollar plus vehicle uh, that we know a lot of people just can't necessarily afford, or is it a ramp up of some of the lower price models that maybe not have the same profit margins, but maybe provides a bit more scale? All right. Hey, we still got to take a look at Tesla. We're looking at Lamb Research coming out right now. Shares bouncing around he in the after hours. question, Tim. Down three tenths of one percent. He ignored you. Yeah, just I was told to do Lamb Research. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, adjusted busy. earnings per okay. share for the second quarter uh, beat the average analyst estimates. Uh, adjusted earnings per share coming in at seven uh, fifty-two versus estimates of seven dollars and fourteen cents. Revenue coming in at three point seven six seven six billion. Estimates were for three point seven billion. Adjusted gross margin uh, coming in above estimates as well and adjusted operating margin coming in just above estimates. Listen, well. the, the issue with Tesla is, and you know, I'm looking at our live blog too, and they're pointing out what the company says about currently between being between these two major growth waves. If you believe that ultimately, whether it's the expansion of the Model 3 Y platform and then that is going to provide momentum going forward, if you feel like that this company is going to provide more growth going, you know, down the road as the world says it's still committed to electric vehicles, talk to our Keith Naughton. He says EV Universe, it's still growing. It's just growing at a slower pace and adoption is slower. So if you continue to believe the Tesla growth story, then you buy some of this. If you are more skeptical and concerned, um, certainly the pullback that we've seen as of late, then you get a little bit nervous about maybe what we're hearing. Yeah, but do you buy it at, you know, P.E. at 66 times? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the question, I think, too. And you're looking at the stock off by over 5%. I, I do want to go back, though, to that headline from Tesla. Volume growth may be notably lower this year than 2023. Um, and we know that they still have some production issues. Getting batteries is going to be hard. And all of that kind of factoring in here, Romain. Well, I mean, I want to go back, though, to Carol's uh, question that she posed here, because this gets to the idea here of competition. I was looking at the market share numbers. I mean, they've gone from 60 plus percent, well, really 100 percent market share at one mm -hmm. point. But in recent years, 60 plus percent down to 55 percent and I'm looking at the stocks of all these other names of Rivian and GM and Ford also moving lower here in sympathy I mean this isn't really a Tesla story anymore this is really about EV uh, EV adoption as you say Carol and whether that is strong enough to sustain some of the valuations that are that have been baked into some of these stocks i.e. Tesla what yeah did we hear I, from the Toyota chairman he said 30 30 percent yeah. of ultimately 30 percent of you're talking you know, the to the Toyota is, chairman no that's what he said I have a, oh oh you're talking to him you already talked to them <laughs> no no oh because I have a question 
30s. I have a question for him if you can pose. I know you guys do a lot on radio days. there and you yeah. never tell us about. But remember, I mean, they were Not really. Not just about wine. Right, but remember, there was all the, the, the criticism that they hadn't pushed deeper into the EV space. And they were basically saying hybrids are where mm -hmm. it's at and yeah. we don't really see the value in pushing the EV. That seemed, they got mocked for that, but now that seems present. Yeah, exactly. Well, we will see. Again, this is another thing of Maybe. like, does it just take longer to get there? Don't overpromise. <laughs> In the meantime, Tesla shares are down about 4%. Remember, what did they rally more than 100% last year. So, again, maybe it's that valuation rethink. So we'll continue to watch uh, in the aftermarket. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Some earnings for everybody. Uh, our cross-platform uh, coverage on radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. We'll see you again tomorrow. We'll get back to Tesla in a, just a minute here. One of the biggest decliners in after hours trading, one of the biggest gainers in after hour trading, IBM. Those results crossing the wire here. The fourth quarter revenue for IBM coming in at about $7.38 billion. The street on average is looking for about $17.3 billion. So a modest beat there uh, on the top line number here. Uh, cash flow also looks like a pretty decent beat as well. $6.1 billion versus street estimates of about $5.4 billion. I want to get to the bottom line uh, here uh, for the company here, and it's a bit of a jumble here. So bear with me here. Operating EPS coming in at about $3.87 a share. The street on average is looking for about $3.76 here. There uh, do appear to be a lot of sort of one-off items in here that we're going to have to uh, sort of call our way through here. But based on some of these numbers here uh, right now, Scarlett, it does appear that this is a pretty solid quarter here. Consulting revenue was up. Software revenue was up. And of course, their overall revenue was up, though still a little bit light than what the street was looking for. Shares up about 5% here in after hours trading. And so, uh, software and consulting were expected to be the segments that, prepare, that performed better than expected. The other number that catches my eye is the free cash flow for the full year, about $12 billion. That is higher than what analysts had anticipated, which was $10.92 billion. There's been a lot of talk about all these different efforts by the CEO to kind of uh, reposition IBM. Yeah. It has now put it in a position where it can uh, achieve sustainable revenue growth. All right. Anurag Grana joining us right now. Bloomberg Intelligence's senior technology analyst for a fast look here at IBM. Anurag, the numbers are out here. What do you see here that really jumped out? Oh, the free cash flow number, I think 12 billion is really going to make a lot of people happy because, you know, we were going in, I think consensus were at 10.9 billion. We said anything up, you know, around 11 billion would be a welcome sign, but 12 billion shows um, operational efficiencies, organic growth rate, margin expansion. I think this is, uh, they're executing well over here. And what is it able to do? What is IBM able to execute on now that it has a stronger free cash flow of about 12 billion? You know, one of the things it will give a little more confidence to investors because this has been a story about, um, you know, slow growth and all sorts of different accounting over the last several years, I would say. If this is I'm talking about before Arvind took over. But in the last two years, execution has been clean. They have been steadily improving their sales growth. Um, I think this free cash flow number should help them to actually even, you know, push a little uh, on more M&A down the road because I think that's what the company needs right now. M&A down the road. Tell me a little bit more about what you think think they lack and they need and they can acquire at a good price right now. So one of the things you would see when you look at this company, you know, one third of the revenue is uh, infrastructure, one third of the revenue is software. Software is something I think they should invest more in. This is a secular area where you'd see the, the industry growing at 10 to 12 uh, percent. Infrastructure business for IBM is not going to grow over the next three years. It's good free cash flow generator, but that's we don't have a, gro a growth there. So just like what they did with Red Hat a few years ago, they should you know double down and, uh, and add more assets in that category because that's what's going to drive growth. Uh, talk to us about AI a little bit. Of course, highlighted in the press release, the CEO basically saying the client demand for AI is accelerating here. Is it accelerating at the same rate that we're seeing at some of their competitors? See, for IBM, it's going to be a little bit longer, perhaps, you know, next year, not, not in 2024, only because I think the enterprises are not as keen on deploying some of these large technologies because there is a lot of copyright issue, data cleanup. So I think there is going to be a lot of testing. Uh, IBM should see a, a ramp up in second half in their consulting business because of it. But I think it's going to be, it's not going to be a material uh, generator of revenue, at least in, in this, this year for us. Anurag Rana representing the best of Bloomberg, a uh, great team down there at Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, jumping on here to walk us through IBM earnings. Those shares up about 5% here in after hours trading. A lot more coming up in the program here, including more on Tesla. Those results just crossing the wire here. Those shares lower right now. This is the close on Bloomberg.
Tesla earnings just crossing the wire. Adjusted EPS coming in at 71 cents a share. A modest miss there. Revenue coming in at $25.2 billion. A modest miss there as well. Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow joining us right now to talk a little bit more about what we learned in this results. No delivery forecast, but let's start off with something that Ross Gerber was telling us here on the program earlier in the session here, that he was really looking closely at those gross margin numbers, 17.6%. And when you adjust here for those regulatory credits, 17.2%. Yeah, and it's important because automotive gross margin X those credits slightly above what were muted expectations. Tesla still has industry leading margins for making electric vehicles. You know, if you strip out uh, ZEV and you strip out uh, the benefit of software, they still kind of lead in this space. But in the final three months of 2023, discounting price cuts using that lever in both directions was a factor along with despite it being a record quarter in terms of sales uh the, you know an impact on the bottom line which they they've kind of stayed the course on I think it's interesting, too, when we talk about the gross margins holding up. Also, the free cash flow number came in well above estimates, more than $2 billion. I think the street was only looking for one and a half here. Is that kind of a one-off here, or is there a trend line that we should be paying attention to? Well, they're being efficient at a time where they're trying to ramp up production of Cybertruck, which is a new model. Uh, you have to spend to bring new product online because of the time it takes to staff up and tool up new assembly lines and the investments that are needed for that. Um, at the same time as their profits taking a hit from the macro environment that we're in. Uh, but also, you know, this is the kind of first real financial read, read, read we've had since Zach Kirkhorn left as CFO. And Zach was a very good manager of the bottom line and very good manager of Tesla's cash position. His departure doesn't seem to have impacted that trend. I want to go to something that Tesla said, which makes it really difficult to understand what's going on, which is yes. that uh, volume growth will slow notably. That's pretty vague. And we know that yes. uh, for 2023, they delivered a record 1.8 million vehicles. Yes. And a lot of analysts were anticipating something in the neighborhood of 2.2 million vehicles for this year. What does it mean when Tesla has talked so much about a 50% um, annual growth rate in, in deliveries? What's critically important to state is that that 50% CAGR, which goes back to early 2021, starting from the end of the 2020 financial year, related to production. So what they're saying on a compound average annual growth basis is that they would increase their production capacity and the number of vehicles they built by 50%. They built more than 1.8 million in 2023. Had they maintained that 50% CAGA, they would have been on track to build 2.5 million in 2024. But they're saying the opposite. A, they're not giving us formal guidance. They've omitted that from the, volume, the, the graph in the deck titled volume. But what they're saying is that while they're ramping up their first gen models, Y and 3, they also have imminent plans to bring on this next gen model that we have few details about, which will be built in Texas. Um, and for that reason, they're guiding us to substantially lower growth. But that growth, again, it is on a compound basis and it's based on production, not delivery. Mm. But you can extrapolate out, right? And if they build less cars, they have fewer to deliver to customers. And when we talk about this next gen platform, we're talking about the lower cost sedan. Is that right? Why, why not just yeah. go with that? Next gen vehicle makes it sound like it's going to be ramped up to something akin to the Cybertruck. Well, I don't know if you guys have your Tesla bingo cards printed on your <laughs> on your anchor desks right now, but this will be a, a or the question for the call. You would have seen the Reuters report that Tesla has informed suppliers to brace for this. The understanding and the hypothesis for a long time has been that this will be a much lower price point vehicle, 25,000. The bill of materials, therefore, will be completely different. The the lining up of the assembly lines in the factory in Texas, which is already trying to handle Cybertruck and why that needs to be thought through as well. So you think of it almost in many cases as yeah. downtime, preparing that facility for a product that is not that there, but will impact the production of those that are already in production. All right, uh, Ed Ludlow, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, a breakdown here of Tesla's earnings. Those shares moving lower here. Some concerns here uh, about more what's going forward rather than the quarter that just was. But speaking of the quarter that just was, we are getting preliminary results out of Ford right now. Now, they're not scheduled to report until next month, but the company is saying that it actually sees a pre-tax remeasurement loss of about $1.7 billion. The company says the pre-tax loss in the fourth quarter of 2023 will amount to about 
seven billion dollars, and it cites uh, pensions and some other uh, retirement benefit plans here. Uh, we're going to have to try to get you some more details on that. But Scarlett, we talk about an auto sector right now. At least we know in terms of sales growth now is kind of in a weird place right now. It's kind of we bought all the vehicles we can buy. We can't yeah. afford to buy anymore. And now, at least for Ford here, they're dealing with apparently some other issues internal. And they're rethinking their whole electric vehicle program as well, and all the costs that go along with that. So this is something mm -hmm. really interesting that um, they would release this at the same time as Tesla, whose numbers so far at first blush are not looking that great. Yeah, absolutely. And Ford uh, scheduled to report on February 6th. All right. Coming up, we're going to get more insight on the challenges, specific challenges facing Tesla from Beth Kindig. She is lead tech analyst at IO4. This is Bloomberg. A closer look at those results out of Tesla and a closer look about what they didn't tell us. That delivery forecast that normally accompanies all of these reports, absent, notably absent here. And the company kind of alluding to the potential drop in volume on the year. Beth Kendig joining us right now, lead technology analyst over at IO Fund. Talk a little bit more, I guess, about what she's seen here. And there's been a lot of discussion, you know, over the last few months about some of the price cuts and other incentives that Tesla had to offer in order to get to those record deliveries last year. How much of that was a factor here in some of the softness that we saw in the bottom line numbers? Yeah, with ASP declining, uh, the biggest evidence is that Q4 delivered about 4% higher than Q2, but revenue is only 1% higher. The street is clearly reading this, that even though margins improved quarter over quarter, we now face a revenue growth issue potentially into 2024. That is not the best uh, message, especially considering that BYD, the Chinese EV, uh, just passed Tesla as the number one battery electric vehicle a company in the world. Uh, Tesla and BYD have always been neck and neck. Uh, in Q3, they were equal. In Q4, BYD passed Tesla. This raises concerns as to whether BYD is going to continue to eat into Tesla's share. China is a very big market. So if you read between all the different um, data points here, how much of an impact is China really having on Tesla? It looks like a pretty big impact. So that gets us to a broader question here about what type of additional ramp up we would see. Remember, they're still supposed to be building that factory in Europe. There's all this talk about ramping up Cybertruck here. Is that just kind of a fever dream, at least in the short term, meaning over the next year or so? Those are great questions. I, I love what NVIDIA has said in the past. There is only one China. I think that's very true <laughs> yeah. for Tesla. It's very true for a lot of tech stocks. So Cybertruck and other um, you know, innovative products, they're great to hear about, but it comes down to there's only one China, and tech is a very competitive space. So when you move from number one to number two, uh, those with experience in tech stocks immediately take notice because it's not Tesla versus nobody now, it's Tesla versus BYD and many others, but BYD being, being here in first place. Yeah, and of course, uh, Tesla giving up that crown to BYD just earlier this month. Um, how has the fundamental story of investing in Tesla changed? Because for so long, we were glued to that gross margin number. And we know that um, when you look at the automotive gross margin, when you back out the regulatory credits, it came in at 17.2% versus more than 24% last year. But how has that narrative shifted now that we are getting more vague uh, outlooks than ever? Certainly the narrative has shifted, like you pointed out. Out of the MEG-7, Tesla is the one that did not reclaim its valuation in the historic year we had for the NASDAQ last year. As you know, the first six months of the year, best performance in NASDAQ's history, your Microsofts, Googles, Meta, they really reclaimed their valuations, and Tesla had struggled to re reclaim its valuation, and it's now at a five forward price to sales, should be at a 10. Uh, so the market is really reading into these problems and saying, there might be easier stocks right now. Mm. Uh, with that said, if we can get uh, consistent margin improvement, Tesla's trading so low that it could become a buy. What's the way to boost revenue at this point? Is it more price cuts and, and that it just has to keep doing that to, to regain some market share, especially in China? Yeah, we made the point, it was about two quarters ago, that unfortunately for Tesla and many other consumer facing stocks, this is out of their control. We really are dealing with um, an interest rate issue. Uh, they've been high long enough that the automotive sector is feeling it. We don't actually see this as a Tesla issue at all. Uh, it's just simply that rates are 
too uh, too big of an issue obstacle in order for these automotive companies to overcome. Yeah. They have to keep cutting their prices, and ultimately, it's hurting their margins. So we think yeah. this is out of Tesla's control. Yeah, definitely a much bigger story than just Tesla. Something we're going to talk about a little bit more in just a second. Beth, great to talk to you. Beth can dig their lead technology analyst over at IO Fund. And when we come back, we're going to open up the Almanac for a closer look at 14 years ago this week when an obscure startup company received a U.S. government loan to build an automotive factory in California for a battery-powered vehicle. That company, of course, was Tesla. But do you know how much the government lent to that company on that day? The answer coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Around 1.4 million electric vehicles were sold in the U.S. last year. 55% of those had a Tesla emblem on the hood. The company's success is already the perfect Harvard case study, but the path to market dominance might have looked different if not for a U.S. Energy Department loan given out 14 years ago this week. It was a $465 million loan to Tesla in January 2010 that helped the company buy a shuttered GM plant out in California that would become the focal point of the EV revolution. By the end of June 2010, Tesla had the first IPO of a U.S. automaker in a half a century, with Elon Musk ringing the opening bell at the Nasdaq in Times Square and showing off a prototype of that $109,000 two-seat roadster. Bloomberg spoke with Elon Musk that day. Our, our goal is to, uh, and to create uh, the most compelling and competitive car company of the 21st century. Uh, that's, that's what we intend to do. And here we are today. Despite the fits and starts, the near-death experiences, the doubters, the haters, Tesla's $600 billion valuation in the market right now is more than any other car maker out there and more than all but eight other publicly traded companies in the world. Tesla is here to stay. And now with more than a half dozen other automakers, including Rivian, Kia, and Volvo, on the bandwagon, battery-powered cars, they're here to stay as well. And that brings us to our big number of the day. It's 11%. That's the forecast by UBS for growth in new U.S. EV sales this year, 11 percent. That would be down from 47 percent in 2023 and 60 percent growth in 2022. And that's the concern, that the early adopters already have their EVs. EVs account for a tenth of new vehicle sales now. But how do you get from the 10 percent market share to the Biden administration's goal of 50 percent share in the next six years? Longer battery life, lower maintenance costs, more charging stations? Yeah, that'll definitely help, but you definitely, you'll need much more than that cool touchscreen, $7,500 in tax credits, and all the bluster and bravado out of Sir Elon Musk. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Let's continue this discussion on where the overall EV market is headed and bring in Stephanie valdez Striti. She is Director of Industry Insights at Cox Automotive. Stephanie, it's so good to speak with you, and I really love the setup that Romain gave us to kind of show us where we are in the EV journey. Um, notably, Tesla declined to give a full-year delivery forecast beyond saying car sales may be notably lower this year. Talk to us a little bit about how price cuts are not the issue here, but perhaps high borrowing costs and what that does to the economics of buying versus leasing an electric vehicle versus traditional gas cars, which uh, so far are holding up okay. Yeah, great. Thank you for the question. You're right. It's all about affordability. And so for EVs, fortunately last year, and you know, Tesla dominates still the market. And so when they cut prices, it really shook the industry and really lowered the price point. So I think going into 2024, we're going to continue to see a lot more discounts, a lot more price cuts to really meet that consumer price point where they feel comfortable buying an EV. And with the IRA, I think that's going to help in terms of those vehicles that are eligible. For those that aren't, I think leasing is going to be a good option for consumers because they can still get that 7,500 benefit as well and even test out an EV if they're not sure they want to own one yet. Yeah, leasing makes a lot of sense for consumers, especially if they are able to kind of test out that technology before committing to it full time for years to come. What does it look like, though, from the car dealership's perspective or from the car maker's perspective? Yeah, I think I think for leasing, it's a good option for the car dealers, especially they want to move that that inventory. But I think one of the key things is going to be education, really consumer education, really able to convey that value proposition of buy an EV, like talk about the technological benefits, the environmental benefits, the lower TCO, total cost of operation. So I think it's going to be really 
this is going to be tough, right? As we heard earlier in the segment that we're moving to this mainstream majority. And so I think it's going to take a lot of work to sell these EVs. But I think there's a lot of plans in place and we can get there. Well, there's a lot. I mean, and you're up against public perception, too. We were talking a little bit earlier about the big cold snap over the nation uh, over the last a few weeks and people reporting, you know, sort of issues with their EVs. Uh, and, you know, we should point out that gas powered vehicles also tend to have issues sometimes uh, when you get below a certain threshold of temperature. But there is a narrative out there that for whatever reason, EVs aren't as accessible, and I'm not talking about affordable, I'm talking about accessible in terms of how to drive, the range anxiety, the weather conditions, and then people look at that and they say, I'm just going to go to a gas car, maybe a hybrid, but I'm not ready for an EV. What overcomes that? Because I'm not hearing anything out of Tesla on that, and even the other automakers like Ford and GM don't really seem to be addressing this issue either. Yeah, when I think about the headlines last week with the Teslas in Chicago, I think of two things really, right? Infrastructure. We need more infrastructure that's reliable, but also going back to consumer education, really teaching consumers how to prepare, how to take care of these batteries, love your battery, what to do when it gets to extreme weather conditions, and specifically for cold weather, being able to pre-treat that battery, make sure it's warm before you charge it, and knowing that it's going to take longer to charge so that you give yourself more time, you plan. So I think from a consumer perspective, it's going to take a lot of just education and just know how to take care of this battery and changing the mindset. But I think um, we can arm the sales force with that. I think we can get there. Well, let's talk about some of the, the, the targets, though, because I, I think we'll get there. I think you're right. But the question is, what time frame? We talk about the White House's uh, ambitious target for 50 percent of all new car sales by what I think it was 2030 uh, to be EVs. Right. And we've already heard from a lot of dealers and uh, even some of the automakers say that's just not going to happen. It's just demand just isn't their year. So what is the runway to 50 percent or even something greater than that, uh, where that is the dominant car sold on the streets right now is going to be a battery powered one? You know, I think I don't, I don't think we'll get to the 50 percent probably like you were talking about by 2035. But if you think about um, the car legislation, the regulations, there's 12 states that have already signed up for that. So I think we're going to see start to see more volume um, adoption in those states. But I think it's going to be this similar to what we had last year. It's going to be a bumpy road. There's going to be lots of stops and goes and zigzags. But I think we're going to continue to see the carrots, so the incentives. We recently saw the announcement that there's going to be more uh, investment or incentives for EV charging for those rural underserved areas. So I think it's going to be continued incentives, um, education. And then I also think we're probably going to see more hybrid sales, right? Because yes. that's a good gateway between full adoption of EVs. No, that's a really great point. I'm so glad you bring it up, especially since uh, certain companies are more um, invested in the hybrid model than others. Are hybrids not taking market share, but are they absorbing market share from the gas-powered vehicles or from, do you think, uh, EVs? Yeah, I think from both, right? I think it's a good, you think about like Toyota, the Camry, the, you know, in that se segment, the highest volume vehicle, and they're going to be open. Consumers are only going to be able to buy that vehicle as a hybrid. So I think we're going to start to see hybrids grow over the next year. I think next year or this year probably get to like 25 percent of EVs and hybrids. Um, so I think it's definitely going to eat some of the EV share, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it's a good transition. All right. The transition vehicle uh, for 2024 and perhaps beyond. Stephanie Valdez-Streedy of Cox Oda Automotive, thank you so much for joining us today. All right. We want to get, uh, of course, a snapshot of all the other companies that have been reporting results. A number of companies reporting just uh, since the closing bell. Here to help us take us through some of those results are our very own Abigail Doolittle and Emily Grafeo. Abigail? Well, Scarlett, let's start off with the shares of ServiceNow. This, of course, is an enterprise software company. They also work through the cloud. Now, the stock had been higher initially on very positive report. Uh, they, the stock had been up about 2%. At this point right now, it's down about four-tenths of 1%. I'm not exactly sure what delivered, uh, what's uh, weighing on the stock. They really delivered sales beat. They also put up adjusted earnings of $3.11 versus the estimate of up to uh, $2.79. Uh, their project revenue growth uh, was $24 percent versus 22 percent uh, and they're talking about AI boosting. You can see one big winner though here is IBM. The stock heading to its best day potentially if these gains hold into the open tomorrow. Since April of 2022 they beat sales and earnings. Uh, very small misses for their software and consulting businesses but the real story here free cash flow more than six billion dollars much higher than the estimate of five point one one billion dollars and they also see fiscal year free cash flow of twelve billion dollars.
versus $10.92 billion. That stock, again, in the green right now and heading to potentially what could be the best day in a couple of years. Emily, what are you watching? Well, Abigail, I'm looking at Las Vegas Sands because that stock is moving up higher for the casino operator. And we're also looking at CSX. I'll start with that because that's on the board. This is a freight railroad operator. And I will note the stock kind of flat right now, but it dropped 1.5% today in its worst decline since 2023. The EPS beat estimates, but just slightly coming in at 45 cents versus estimates of 40 Four cents fourth quarter revenue also beating slightly coming in at 3.68 billion that's down 1.3 percent year over year but over estimates of 3.63 billion and another interesting takeaway for the freight railroad earnings that I noticed just quickly looking at the report the fuel costs coming in down 14 percent year over year at 352 million that was higher than estimates but still we talk about disinflation and you are seeing it here in the earnings reports and then just quickly getting to Las Vegas Sands. That stock uh, moving after earnings fourth quarter net revenue beat estimates coming in at $2.92 billion versus estimates of $2.89 billion. Adjusted property EBITDA also beating. We know for Las Vegas Sands that a lot of their revenue comes from Singapore and from Macau. And post-pandemic, it's been pretty tough for these companies to really see consumers come out and spend on entertainment, go to casinos. At least right now, we are seeing an improvement in that from the earnings. We even had CEO Rob Goldstein saying that he is deeply enthusiastic about growth in Macau and Singapore going ahead. So Las Vegas stands up 2% in the post market right now. Emily Grafeo and Abigail Doolittle, a nice roundup here of some of the earnings that we've gotten after the bell. We should point out, Scarlett, Las Vegas stands uh, among uh, one of the bigger gainers here in after hours trading. It's at least in the top 10. 2% gain might not seem like much here, but that is kind of your winner. IBM uh, basically leading the pack up about 5% in after hours trading. Yeah, and of course, Tesla shares moving down in after hours trade. Uh, since earnings season began, we've seen the S&P 500 <laughs> gain 1.9% hit record highs, but it feels like earnings season is delivering reality check to a lot of investors. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I was taking a look at that record run here. I mean, we're in overbought territory on both mm -hmm. the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P above that 70 threshold here. So that's going to be a concern for technical traders. And then it gets to the fund, the corporate fundamentals. Are they going to be enough to support uh, where valuations are right now? There are a lot of people that say, yeah. There's a lot of I'm not, I, I don't know where those people Well, are. it all depends yeah. because Tesla is one of the Magnificent Seven and the numbers didn't deliver. So yeah. we'll see what happens when uh, you have the likes of Apple and Meta and Alphabet and Microsoft reporting. Let's just show you what happened during trading today because as we mentioned, the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, they continue to melt up um, any weakness, excuse me, any green at this point is a record high, even though there was weakness in afternoon trading that left the overall market mixed. Uh, we certainly came off our highs. Treasuries, you could see, declined. They're pushing yields higher. There was poor demand for the five-year note auction and remain where one week away from the Treasury announcing its borrowing schedule for the February to April period. You know, I just noticed something. 48, 68, 55. That was the closing uh, on the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the Bloomberg survey of strategists uh, and their year-end targets for the S&P 500. 4867. Oh, so well. basically we're a point or a point or two above so that right now. So what does that now. mean for the rest so, of the year? I don't like think you can take the rest of the year off. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of volatility. Lock in your, lock in your gains now. <laughs> All right, we have much more coming up. This is the close on Bloomberg. Now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And first up, Romain, is Robert Rubin, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary. Yeah. He says the U.S. is in a, quote, terrible place when it comes to federal deficits. Take a listen to what he told Wall Street Week host David Weston. I think that the risks are even greater today because our debt-GDP ratio is a approximately, well, CBO estimates at about 100 percent right now. It's the highest in the history of the country, except for 1946 and 47, when we were coming back out of World War II. I think the risks are enormous, and some of them are materializing already, like higher interest rates and effect on inflation, you know, in part, not in full. And others haven't materialized yet, but I think they're out there and, and sooner or later will materialize if we don't correct our, our fiscal trajectory. 
So how do you solve it? He says, yes, spending cuts, but largely, he says, definitely higher taxes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the part I think everyone latched onto is the reason why uh, that story is one of the most read on yes. Bloomberg. Uh, yeah, he might be right, but let's just say I don't think any of us are rooting for higher Voters taxes. Voters are not You can actually message. catch that full interview uh, on Friday at 6 p.m. on Wall Street Week. I want to uh, move on uh, to another person I'm keeping an eye on, Ken Chenault. He's kind of been, uh, I guess, in the background since he left American Express. Remember, he pretty much spent three, four decades yeah. there, was CEO for Built I 17, really. 18 years uh, before he left. He's been over at General Catalyst Partners, but a great story on the Bloomberg Terminal about the company called Built Rewards. This is basically you pay your rent and you get rewards for it. He is now, uh, not only is there an investment rate in for this company, but he's now also going to be chairman of the board here. Uh, and this is an interesting move here because we talk about you say he built that up, but think about what he built. I mean, he was a real pioneer in these rewards types of programs mm -hmm. for the American Express credit cards, exactly the type of stuff that Built is doing right now here. So it'll be interesting to see what type of expertise he brings to the table. No, and the, the startup is fascinating, too, right? Because they're also in talks with mortgage servicers so about partnerships allowing you as a homeowner yeah. to be able to earn rewards for making mortgage payments. And, you know, and you would probably appreciate this. You mm -hmm. know how he ended up uh, in Built? How? It was a Roger Goodell, his friend Roger Goodell. The NFL commissioner. Yeah, apparently he had some sort of ties to it, and he told Ken Chenault, you got to go talk to these guys. They're, they're good people. they got yeah. a good business, and uh, they, they are. So Roger Goodell, the, the matchmaker. Right. Roger Goodell, hook me yeah. up with someone. All right, Romaine, um, let's talk about number three, and that is Jon Stewart. After a nine-year absence, the comedian is returning to host The Daily Show once a week through the November election. He returns to Comedy Central on <laughs> February 12th. <laughs> Once a week? Yeah, thought, he's only doing Mondays because that's when the most number of people watch the show. <laughs> okay, who's doing Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? Um, other rotating guest hosts, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, this is an interesting move. I mean, of course, you know, when he left, there was a lot of talk about how no one could fill his shoes. Trevor Noah, God bless him, I love him, but it, it was not. Time? It was not quite the same show. No, it but, definitely but a different you don't vibe. expect it to be. The and same now show. he's moved on, and I haven't watched the show in a while. But I feel like every time I see a clip from it, there's a different host there. So it seems like they haven't really found a permanent host. So I guess why not bring back, uh, you know, one of the OGs? there and uh, especially in the build up to yeah. the election right i mean yeah. 2024 is going to be all about was, what happens between me, Trump i'm having a senior Biden. moment who was who was the host before stewart took that show over was it well, was it Craig Kilborn? Yeah, yeah, I, it was the tall guy from ESPN. Yeah, it was yeah, Craig yeah, yeah. Kilborn. Yeah, I, think so. I liked him too. Whatever, is he still alive? Uh, he was on the late show circuit for a while. <laughs> I'm not sure where he is right now. All right, well, John Stewart coming back for one day. A Mondays week. only. It must through be November. Nice. <laughs> we can only hope that Scarlet Foo. All That's right. Uh, we are here five days a week here, and we are setting you up for all of the big market moving events every day. We're going to have a nice breakdown here of what to watch over the next 24 hours. Stick with us. This is the close on Bloomberg. ECB decide to cut rates. We are on the right path, but I'm not going to shout victory. Bloomberg Television brings you the breaking news and detailed analysis after ECB President Christine Lagarde's press conference. The wages issue is what I think the ECB is really focused on. June is our base case. There is still a 50-50 chance of, of a rate cut coming just slightly before that. In many ways, they should have been cutting already earlier to stimulate growth. The ECB decides Thursday on Bloomberg Television. U.S. GDP data. U.S. GDP data coming out tomorrow. All signs right now pointing to slower a final three months of 2023. Let's get right to Anna Wong over at Bloomberg Economics, our chief U.S. Ec uh, economist. And Anna, I was taking a look at some of the projections that we have on the Bloomberg terminal. Two percent growth in the final quarter of the year. That's a huge deceleration from the 4.9 percent rate that we saw in the third quarter. Yeah, I mean, uh, by you know, by the law of momentum, um, it's 4.9 percent from Q3 is not sustainable. But the question is, is 2.0 percent GDP growth in fourth quarter t still too strong for the Fed? Well, we think that you know, the, for, for the Fed, what they want to see is GDP growth below 1.8 percent, which is their assessment of potential GDP growth. But that said. I think that we should take tomorrow's number, which likely could uh, be a around 2 percent, with a huge grain of salt because GDP numbers tend to be, get to, to be hugely revised down. Particularly lately, we've been seeing a disconnect between soft data and hard data, with the soft data way weaker than GDP uh, in, in the fourth quarter. So we think that um, it's, pot it's very likely that yeah. GD this GDP number will be revised down in future months. 
And of course, we know that consumer spending has been holding its own. Um, certainly, the anecdotal evidence supports that. So it'd be business spending that's really driving the slowdown. What data points to that slowdown in data um, in business spending? Yeah, so what's very important in tomorrow's data release would be the uh, December durable goods order. Right now, we are seeing shipments exceeding new orders, which uh, forebodes a drop in inventories in the coming months. And that will be driving GDP uh, growth deceleration in the next quarter, if that's the case. Uh, particularly, also, we are seeing that retail is not as strong as the, the latest retail data suggests, because if you look at the non-seasonal adjusted number is in fact weaker than the December in the last couple of years. Anna Wong, who leads our economics uh, coverage down at Bloomberg Economics. It's going to be uh, an interesting day tomorrow because that deceleration, Scarlett, we talk about from 4.9 to 2. And as Anna said, that that could end up getting revised lower uh, once we get uh, the updates here. That does maybe suggest that maybe the landing is not going to be as soft as some people right. have priced it. Could we even, do I want to say the word recession? Could that be in the cards? Well, we spoke with Lauren Goodwin yesterday, and she said, yeah, she's anticipating one. She said things will be very minor and very short, yeah. but don't count it out that we, that we will get one. All right, so perhaps soft landing goes to rocky landing at this point. All right, as we set you up for what to watch tomorrow, we are going to keep an eye on those U.S. GDP numbers. We're also going to get jobless claims tomorrow morning as well. You're in the U.S. Yeah, which have been very, very solid. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of people um, applying for jobless benefits, and that's been a source of labor market strain, so it really makes the Fed's job very interesting. There's also a Fed policy. A central bank policy meeting, not yet the Fed. Yeah, not, well, not the Fed. Yeah, don't front run the Fed. Over <laughs> in Europe, the ECB uh, uh, scheduled uh, to, to, to talk. Right, and yeah. they're not going to make a change. The ex they're expected to stand pat, but there's also some uh, rate decisions coming out of other central banks in Europe. Yeah, we're going to get uh, quite a few others, including out of Turkey Nor and Norway and a few others here. This gets us a bit back to the heart of the question right now, that for a while we've had sort of this respite from all the macro talk, mm -hmm. from all of the Fed speak and the central bank speak, but that's going to come back front and center. ECB, of course, this week, and then, of course, uh, at the end of, uh, was it next week? Is that the end of the month? The 31st? Yeah, the that's 31st. coming up. Middle yeah, of next week, yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to get the yeah, Fed. Yeah, we're going to get the Fed. So, uh, so that's going to dominate here. Of course, we are still in earnings season, and that right now still remains the focal point as corporate fundamentals in focus, and we get some big earnings tomorrow. Yeah, and it's from a variety of companies, right? Whether it's Blackstone, whether it's Union Pacific on the industrial side, the tech and earnings continue to roll in. Intel will be the latest chip maker to announce. I see the three ones on here. I, Intel could be interesting here. We know they've been a relative laggard compared to the rest of the chip sector here, but have been trying to make some moves. And it'll be interesting to see what the credit card companies have to say about uh, spending there as well. Absolutely. Visa and Capital One among those reporting, and T-Mobile, um, of course, a laggard when it comes to Verizon and AT&T in mobile phone operators. You don't get any better earnings coverage out there than right here on Bloomberg. Please tune in tomorrow. Scarlett and I will be back with a full breakdown of all your after-the-bell earnings. In the meantime, stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next right after us. Your focus on politics. Until tomorrow, have a good evening. This is Bloomberg.